This episode is inspired by my rereading of Nietzsche's The Will to Power. I'm reading the most recent translation made by Professor R. Kevin Hill and published by Penguin in 2017. It's an amazing book. The story of the will to power all by itself has the makings of a dramatic documentary film. It has this tormented genius, Friedrich Nietzsche, already recognized as one of the great minds of his generation, but forced to retire early for health reasons. He's living an itinerant life, wandering about Europe on a meager pension, but he's nonetheless working vigorously, almost feverishly, on his iconoclastic philosophy possibly culminating in a work that he suggested is going to be his greatest. But then he collapses on the streets of Turin, Italy, only 44 years old. He's losing his mental faculties and most of his grip on reality. It's speculated, uh, mostly by his enemies, that he caught syphilis from consorting with prostitutes. But more likely, we now think he has a slow-developing brain tumor. Nonetheless, the damaged philosopher is confined to an institution for the last decade of his life. But what of his final work, this unfinished manuscript he'd been working on, maybe his magnum opus, what would be its fate? Enter Nietzsche's sister. Nietzsche's sister was not an attractive person. Her full name was Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche. Her husband, Bernard Forster, was an ardent German nationalist and an anti-Semite. He was also a member of uh, composer Richard Wagner's extended circle. He uh, was involved in developing a colony in South America, in uh, Paraguay. But uh, upon Friedrich's collapse, Elizabeth returns to Germany. This is now into the 1890s. Over the next decade, she plans with Heinrich Koselitz as one of Friedrich's longtime friends, He's best known as uh, Peter Gast, a name he used. But Elizabeth and, and Kozulitz are planning to publish an edition of this unfinished manuscript. She goes on to, in the, again, in the 1890s, establish the Nietzsche archive, and she acquires control over Friedrich's literary estate. Now, let's jump ahead one generation later, 1930s, rise of the Nazis. They come to power in 1930, but Elizabeth had become a supporter of the National Socialists in 1930. Before they came to power, she was a believer. The leading Nazi politicians and the intellectuals, most of them love Nietzsche. And so they court the now elderly Elizabeth, who controls Nietzsche's literary estate. She is willing to be so courted, and she lends the prestige of the philosopher's brilliance to this brutal regime. So here's the problem. Elizabeth is anti-Semitic and very friendly to the Nazis. Adolf Hitler himself attended her funeral in 1935. And not only is she Friedrich Nietzsche's sister, but his literary executor. Now we go back to 1900. Friedrich dies never having recovered and leaving behind the extensive notes, reworked drafts for his unfinished magnum opus, perhaps. In 1901, under Elizabeth's direction, an edition is published with the title, The Will to Power. And then the question is, what should we make of this work? Now, for a long time, I've argued this way. I taught a cyber seminar on Nietzsche in uh, 1999, and we used The Will to Power, and I got some heat from people about using uh, what was judged by them to be a very tainted work. And my response was to say, well, look, we should treat the will to power the way we treat any author's unpublished notes. When they end up being published, we'll just ask the standard questions about the editor, because editors can make mistakes. Did the editor add anything? Uh, did the editor delete anything significant? Did the editor uh, engage in any misreadings? What about the organization? Is that true to the, the original author's intentions? Are there any uh, elisions where uh, parts of, uh, of text are joined together where perhaps the author didn't intend to do so? Now we can also ask about the published work, uh, how it relates to the published work uh, the, that were published in the author's lifetime. Are the themes in this unpublished notes manuscript that eventually was published after the person died, are those themes identical with uh, earlier published ones or are they perhaps not identical but at least compatible? Are they in tension or do they actually contradict right, earlier published food? And if we find that there is a tension or a contradiction, what does that mean? Does that mean that the author changed his mind? 
and so forth. Anyway, I also argued at the time that every word in the will to power was written by Nietzsche in his notebooks of 1883 to 1888, so it has that level of authenticity. Some of his notes, as uh, author's notes often are, are working out of various thoughts. Some are part of a work in progress that he intended to entitle perhaps the will to power. Some of them uh, on my reading are rough, some are polished, some are repetitive, some are brilliant, some are original, so it's, it's a real mix. Sometimes the notes do contain, from my reading, insights that were perfectly compatible with his published works, or they offer just slightly different formulations of themes that we had seen, or they take those themes and extend those works, uh, those themes rather in, uh, in other directions. And so, my, in my view, this is back in 1999, I judged them to be a must read for any serious Nietzsche scholar. They, uh, they reflect what was going on in Nietzsche's mind in the last working years of his life. At the same time, they are notes in a notebook, so you have to be careful and not ascribe to them as much authority as to the works that Nietzsche did actually publish. And especially if we find any cases where there's a tension between the notes and his publications. That doesn't mean that there's no value to reading the notes. Also, I pointed out that uh, we in the English-speaking world have also had access to the translation of The Will to Power in 1967. That was produced by Walter Kaufman and uh, R.J. Hollingdale. Neither of them anti-Semitic or tainted with any sort of connections to the Nazis. Also, since 1967, everyone has had access to the Colley and Montaneri editions, very carefully worked out editions of Nietzsche's notebooks. So for the last half century, 50 years or so, we uh, have had good scholars working on the text and less fears about taint associated with neo-Nazis. Now, that has, though, been a minority position, the position that I argued here. The most widespread view after World War II really has been to dismiss will to power on the grounds that it was distorted by Elizabeth, either by omissions or by selective highlighting or possibly additions. There is an additional complicating factor. Elizabeth was known to have forged letters that she wrote to people, but she wrote them in Nietzsche's names. And so that raises the suspicion that possibly she did the same for some of the things that appear in The Will to Power. So after World War II, though, there is this strong attempt to rehabilitate Nietzsche, and that required distancing from, from the, the Nazis and any association with them, and that meant that The Will to Power was seen widely as a disreputable work and or illegitimate and so to be dismissed by most people. Now, what we should then ask is the question about Nietzsche's sister and what was her actual involvement in the production of the, uh, the Will to Power. And here, Professor R. Kevin Hill's new edition really is invaluable. As I mentioned before, it was published in 2017. Translator Michael Scarpitti also contributed to the project, but the uh, final version is authorized by Kevin Hill. Kevin Hill has uh, very strong credentials in Nietzsche scholarship philosophically. He's the author of a book published by Oxford University Press entitled Nietzsche's Critiques, the Kantian Foundations of His Thought, an excellent work. He's also the author of a more popular book called Nietzsche, A Guide for the Perplexed, published by Continuum. And the new edition of The Will to Power that was published by Penguin is, of course, worth reading because it's Nietzsche, but even the introduction that is written by Professor Hill is uh, all by itself worth the price of the book. And the point is that everything that appeared in Will to Power in this edition is written by Nietzsche. Now, Hill goes on to argue that what we should do is, of course, look at the two principal people who are involved. This is uh, Kozulitz and his associates and Elizabeth. And what exactly were their roles? And what uh, judgment can we, from our now 21st century perspective, take on the editing job that they did, particularly now that Professor Hill has access to the originals or facsimiles of the original handwritten notes by, by Nietzsche? And this is a quotation from Hill, quote, Most of the editorial work was done by Kozulitz and his associates, 
and not by Elizabeth, as she herself explains in the preface to the 1901 edition, where she stresses explicitly that she is not even the editor of the book, but at most, and even in the most modest sense of the word, a collaborator." Unquote. So apparently what Elizabeth did was none of the translation, very little of the editing work, that her contribution was to organize the effort and to engage in a lot of marketing and promotion of the book. Now that then focuses our attention on Kuzelitz and his various editorial decisions because notes in a notebook require a whole lot of that. And here's Hill's professional judgment, quote, Kozelis appears to have made a good faith effort to select the material that was of the greatest interest, and much of the editorial activity was merely tidying. Unquote. Hill goes on to argue that it was not Kozelis' intention, and he uh, made this explicit, as many people claimed that his intention was not to convey any sort of impression that this was Nietzsche's magnum opus as Nietzsche meant it to be. Further, Hill goes on to argue about uh, Elizabeth in particular, quote, Elizabeth's editorial contribution seems to have been limited to her insistence that Nietzsche produced a philosophical system that could compete with the systems of such figures as Hegel and Kant. So what she's doing, of course, is engaging in some marketing claims. Nietzsche is a towering figure on the order of Kant and, and, and Hegel, and you'll find the evidence of this in this work. Now, that might be marketing hyperbole, but we can, of course, each make our own judgments about the extent to which we do think that what Nietzsche has produced is a system on the order of someone like Kant or Hegel. What she said might be true. Also, apparently, the title the will to power was chosen by Elizabeth. Kuzelitz had made another decision, but Elizabeth overrode him, and will to power then ended up being the, uh, the title that it is initially published, and of course that's the one that sticks now. Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive. Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo-Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics, and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies, and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, and Brisbane starting at 7 pm, and will be holding an all day special event masterclass series starting at 9 am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history, and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're in line, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. The initial edition, 1901, included only 483 selections. So maybe we could argue, well, by excluding a whole lot of stuff that was in Nietzsche's notebooks, maybe it gives a misleading impression. But shortly after that, uh, Kurzelitz and, uh, and Elizabeth uh, Forster Nietzsche uh, did produce an expanded, a more definitive edition that included 1,067 sections, and all of the current and subsequent editions since then have included those 1,067. So shortly thereafter, the, the full set of notebook uh, selections were published. Now, then what we should do is cycle back and say, well, uh, on the possible error, editor errors, you know, the kind of mistakes that editors can make. Did the editors that is to say, Kozilis and or Elizabeth, Nietzsche's sister, 
add anything to Nietzsche's notebooks? And the answer is no, they did not. Did they delete anything of significance? The answer is no. Did they misread anything? And Hill says, well, possibly there are some minor misreadings, and in part, uh, some of those things depend on punctuation placement. Uh, maybe it's not exactly clear where a sentence ends, where a comma should go, and so forth. All right, so possibly there are some, uh, some issues there, but of course, those are the kinds of issues that the editor of anybody's notebooks are going to run into. Were there any elisions, that is to say, putting together two chunks from, from Nietzsche's notebooks that were separated in the original notebooks, but putting them together in a misleading fashion? Hill's answer is no, there doesn't seem to be any of that. What about the overall organization of the book, the, the current edition is organized into four parts uh, with, with titles and subheadings. And uh, Hill goes on to point out that Nietzsche had wrestled with the overall organization of this work and he'd tried out several organizational schemes. And the editors, uh, Kozelitz and uh, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, used one of the organizational schemes that Nietzsche himself had devised. Now, we're then left with the next question, which is, what about the book's connection to the Nazis, was one of the things that, uh, you know, justifiably raises questions in people's minds and can put anybody off is uh, an author or a work who has strong connections to the Nazis. And so particularly after World War II, there was a great scholarly and intellectual effort to distance Nietzsche from any sort of connection from from, from the Nazis. Walter Kaufman and many others who think there is significant philosophical value to be found in Nietzsche, uh, they want to do that din distancing. Now, there, of course, is the issue of what should the connection be between Nietzsche's views and the Nazis, and with or without the will to power, that is a legitimate intellectual historical question. I've written a book on this, uh, Nietzsche and the Nazis, but uh, aside from that plug right now, I'm not going to go into those themes. I'll only say this for now. The, the Nazis did, in fact, use the will to power. Uh, they quoted from it various intellectuals and, and politists and activists, but that is not relevant to accepting or rejecting the will to power. The Nazi politicians and the Nazi intellectuals, they interpreted and they quoted from all of Nietzsche's books. And we don't and we shouldn't reject Nietzsche's published writings for that reason. Instead, we should each read Nietzsche for ourselves and make our own judgments about what's true, what's false, what's interesting, and so forth. So in one way, that is a, an irrelevant issue to uh, the value and the importance of the will to power. But of course, the will to power is important, and wrestling with all of these themes about the editorial history and the later connections to the Nazis, that's important to take up because the will to power really does contain philosophical dynamite. The will to power is organized into four parts with a number of subsections, uh, a grand total of 1,067 sections. And the first part is focused on the theme of nihilism. And some of the striking things here is about how prescient Nietzsche is in diagnosing the nihilism of his era, but going on to argue that it's only going to get worse. In his view, the theme of the death of God, the death of God is in its early stages. And so he goes on, this is in section 31, just to give some sample quotations here, quote, European pessimism is still in its infancy, unquote. And in contrast to Christianity, which tried to stand for something, however pathetically in Nietzsche's views, quote, we are rushing headlong toward the opposite values. Those two are from sections 31 and 30. And what we do find in this opening section focused on nihilism is Nietzsche being very prescient about 20th century intellectual developments, how the 20th century came to be a very skeptical, pessimistic, and nihilistic century, particularly in the humanities disciplines. Section two, one of the longest sections, Nietzsche diagnosing what he sees to be as a failed history of philosophy with its attempts to ground a moral psychology either in the Judeo-Christian tradition or some related thing. 
and Nietzsche from his other published works, Beyond Good and Evil, Genealogy of Morals, published in the middle 19, or 1880s. Nietzsche is very well known for his scathing attacks on Christianity with its roots in, in uh, Judaism, what he calls uh, slave, uh, slave morality. He's also known for his scathing indictments of socialism, which he sees as a pathetic halfway step from slave morality. This is now a theme that is picked up again, for example, in section 30. But there's an interesting point, uh, and it's a theme that uh, Nietzsche had sounded in some of his other works, but he pushes this button harder in this second part of The Will to Power. Christianity has a strong reputation for being a kind of altruism, emphasizing selflessness, a willingness to sacrifice for others, and so forth. And Nietzsche, though, interestingly argues that Christianity really is a kind of selfishness. So we read in section 246 of The Will to Power, this interesting passage, quote, Christianity considered the individual to be of such absolute importance that he could no longer be sacrificed, even though the survival of the species depends upon human sacrifice. So here we have a couple of themes. One is, uh, which Mitra goes on to develop greater length in the will to power, and of course he'd argued this in other works as well, that our goal is to advance the species, right? Human beings as they currently are should be seen as a, a means to an end. And so Nietzsche is arguing that uh, Christianity is standing in the way of this, not for its advocacy of altruism per se, but because of its individualism. And what he is interpreting as a kind of egoism, as a kind of selfishness. It's saying we should treat each individual ego, each individual self as being of so importance that we can't engage in sacrifices. And so since we are actually selfish, we are not being altruistic in the sense of being willing to sacrifice human beings for the sake of the greater good, the, uh, the advancement of the species. So that's an interesting twist. Nietzsche had elsewhere called that kind of uh, individualism the egoism of the weak and his diagnosis of the proper taxonomy ethically within which we should place Christianity is quite striking here. Also in the second section, we find uh, while Nietzsche is, uh, has a reputation for being a strong humanist, for glorifying human potential, a number of very anti-humanistic themes are emerging. In section 303, for example, he says, and this is a direct quote, man is a minor, transitional animal species, which fortunately has had its day, unquote. Of course, the relationship between Nietzsche and the postmodernists is a matter of some fun controversy. I'm reminded here of uh, Foucault's call for the end of man, and I think uh, you know Foucault at various points did call himself a Nietzschean. This is the sort of Nietzschean theme that uh, Foucault and some of the other postmodernists will take and run with in the in the 20th century. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose, in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy to understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do skeptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left, the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all and optimism, now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. <laughs>
pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast, hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. We move on to a sampling from section three, another very long section here. Nietzsche devotes a couple of hundred pages to talking about metaphysics, talking about epistemology. And it's better uh, to say, I think, that what we have is an anti-metaphysics and an anti-epistemology because the consistent themes are an undermining of causality, identity, knowledge, and truth. All of the themes, again, that the postmodernists are going to run with in the coming generations. You can find them in strong proto-form in The Will to Power. Reality is uh, a subjective construct, for example. Here's section 602. Quote, the world seen in perspective, this world as it presents itself to the eyes, ears, and touch, is quite false, no doubt, unquote. And so that's uh, also a Kantian connection that we can find. And the Kantian themes run quite strongly through this third part of will to power. Also on the value side of things, we find Nietzsche's explicit subjectivism and projectionism. We don't find value in the world. It's not in any way intrinsic and or objective. Rather, we put value in the world. Section 590, quote, our values are read into things, unquote. And again, this is a cue that 20th century thinkers the existentialists, for example, will pick up these sort of Nietzschean themes and run with those. Section four, or sorry, uh, part four, rather, of, uh, of uh, the will to power. This is the one that will get m- most people's blood boiling, uh, particularly those of us who were raised in freedom-loving liberal democracies. It was in part four, we find a very strong endorsements of aristocracy, social hierarchy, war and outright slavery. The anti-individualistic themes and the anti-liberal themes in Nietzsche are on display quite prominently in part four. Nietzsche does have a strong reputation though for being an individualist and I've argued against that, that that uh, reputation for individualism uh, elsewhere is uh, much overstated. But just for the purpose of this podcast here, let me quote a couple of sections from, from part four. Section 854 starts off with his general complaint here. Quote, in this age of suffrage universelle, in which everybody is allowed to sit in judgment upon everything and everybody, I feel compelled to reestablish the principle of hierarchy. Unquote. So that then is to say, going against obviously democratic democracy and, uh, and universal voting, not everybody should have political power. Not everybody should be allowed to vote. Not everybody should be in a position of judging. Some people should. Some people shouldn't. Section 855, rank, is determined and distinguished by quantities of power alone, nothing else, unquote. So again, the principle of hierarchy is going to be put in place, and politics and social ordering should be based on power. So a uh, consistent and what is going to be a ruthless power politics. But this is going to be power shorn from any sense that power is for the sake of justice, power for the sake of truth, power for the sake of any redeeming normative value. And again, this is going to be a theme that postmodernists and others are going to take and run with in the 20th century. Section 859, in the modern world, a great battle between individualism and collectivism, kind of free market capitalism, economically, socialism, economically. Nietzsche makes it clear that he is rejecting both of those alternatives. Quote, I stand equally aloof from both moral movements, individualism and collectivism. Unquote. And then he goes on to single out the individualism for special scorn here, quote, because the first knows nothing of hierarchy and would give one individual the same freedom as another, unquote. So we should not be individualistic. We should not believe that everybody should have equal freedom. 
The real question, Nietzsche goes on to argue, is, quote, to what extent a sacrifice of freedom or even enslavement may provide the basis for the production of the higher type. And so, again, a forthright endorsement of the limitations of freedom on many people and even slavery for many people. And it's striking that this is Nietzsche in the 1880s. Of course, one of the important themes of the 19th century had been the ongoing battle against slavery, British Navy, civil war in the United States, many countries and individuals and movements right around the world joining in this great moral crusade against slavery. And then finally, we are getting rid of it. But here is Nietzsche, right, a leading intellectual, arguing quite forthrightly for the opposite. Now, all of these themes are continuous with Nietzsche's earlier published works. But the will to power is the mature Nietzsche. He's now in his 40s. He's a genius, and he's articulating in his unique, powerful rhetorical style themes that do come to dominate 20th and now even 21st century intellectual life. Anybody who is trying to understand contemporary philosophy has to engage with Nietzsche, and in my judgment, that should definitely include engaging with the will to power. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time, and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favorite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher. Music